Okay. See, I, I better turn my, it's on. Uh, we'll start num uh, we'll start part two in the final series of Wing Kong Giwen and Manitou Ki feasts and ceremonies. We were covering that last week of all the ceremonies and feasts, either separately or together, in the thirteen months calendar year. So. We're going to do a little review tonight, and we'll start with a little review. Is this the first one? With part one? Oh, yeah. yeah, let's do a little review. Okay. All right. Peace. We all love a good feast. Yes. Food is cooked and offered at special occasions, and it's sometimes food is just offered uncooked, meaning, you know, during harvest times, it could be vegetables, it could be natural berries, uh, things like that are offered the first of the first harvest. Usually they're offered to the spirits as a thanksgiving. So, uh, there's yearly occurrences. Uh, solstice observances used to be a big thing in the Great Lakes area uh, long, long time ago. Not so much today anymore. They don't, people don't uh, generally have special feasts for that. Sometimes they will have a, um, uh, a sweat lodge or people would to get together, offer a pipe, some prayers, and during a solstice, okay, quarterly solstice. Uh, harvest of food and plants, medicinal plants. Uh, this is part of the yearly gathering of foods where feasts were also how, held. Honoring people alive, and celebrating also i should say we had a we have a remembrance day it's not called a re memorial day memorial day and the larger society happens like once a day but uh ours is that entire month to do the uh, honoring of those who have uh, taken their journey Personal lifetime markers, <laughs> birthdays, namings, uh, graduation, rites of passage, just a lot of things and almost everything uh, our people would uh, have feasts for. Uh, ritual sacrifice to the spirits and other beings as in ceremonies. Okay, and then of course I already said the last one here. So these are the occasion. They can happen any time they are. These are usually feasts happen on a set time during the 13 month calendar year, but these ones can happen throughout the year at any time. And they usually do. Uh, usually their family and sometimes communal events uh like weddings birthdays graduations are big uh today a lot of the nishinaabegs have kind of put like thanksgiving christmas uh easter even some of the christian holidays uh they have feasts family get together you know, so coming of age ceremonies can happen to girls at any time. Usually that's a personal family event. Okay, I know, uh, yeah, first kill ceremonies and feasts are for the boys. Uh, that's a family event. 
uh, and that can happen anytime. Name and ceremonies can happen anytime and feasts, usually a family event. Uh, the family has uh, the opportunity to invite anybody they want. Can be even out of the family, but it's usually the family's call. Honorings. If family or community want to honor people uh, or do things in the community, that happens. Sometimes they they hold these honorings at uh, like yearly powwows or annual events. They'll honor uh, honor that sweat lodge ceremony. They'll honor people during a sweat lodge ceremony. You know, they're white people and make a a, a big feast out of it. So these can ha actually happen any time of the year. This is so, yeah. Food's cooking for a feast. There is a whole protocol to all of this, these feasts. So first of all, Anishinaabe woman should not take part in the preparation of food, cooking or serving the food while they are undergoing their monthly menstrual cycle. Uh, you take it for granted that women would know that, but still yet a lot of times those who live in the cities come back to the reservations, their daughters have grown up there and that was never spoken about too much. Uh, they don't know that, so that they have to be reminded about that. Generally, there's one woman, Gichiae Ikwe, uh, an older lady who's been to many feasts and she's kind of asked to oversee uh, like a communal feast. And so where there's a lot of cooking, she'll ask other women to help and be involved. Usually the Jibak Wu. The best cooks to also ensure that uh, all the feasts first is smudge first. So she knows all the protocol. And then she just uh, kind of directs all of that part. Uh, she can also request that the food that's cooked, the certain dishes, either the modern way or an older way over the fire. Okay, and that might be a, a request out of the family that the food be cooked this way. And that could be for different reasons. Uh, that, of course, it's harder to cook over that way. Some women are used to that, maybe had grown up to that and been exposed to that, and they, they like to do that. And others, because... Uh, maybe the food would taste better because of that, that way. Although small local family feasts are initiated by the family clan patriarch, they usually design the menu and who, who cooks for them. Like she'll gather her sisters, uh, some of the nieces together and she'll initiate like who brings what or what's, what are you going to serve? And so usually that. Potluck is becoming more common, more popular. So, uh, so that, that's, uh, that's a, a thing that's happened. You see a lot where people have a feast, but they'll ask the people to contribute. And I've never seen resistance to that. So people like to contribute some way bring their best dish, you know, or, or something, whatever it might be. I seen, used, used to seen a long time ago what people would bring their own dishes, knives and forks, spoons, whatnot. And, uh, but today some of that doesn't happen. Sometimes they'll bring con larger containers, a pot with a lid on it. Because the feasts are supposed to be, all the food is supposed to be given out. None of it is supposed to be left over. All the food, there's not supposed to be no take-home food. 
It's supposed to be all given away. Okay. Uh, Manitou on a gun? Are these spirit dishes? Are they usually, it's good if you can get, get a natural container like a birch bark or piece of bark or large leaf. And the reason for that is because usually these spirit dishes, this food offered to the spirits or the ancestors have to be taken out into the woods and someplace clean and left. And so something that's biodegradable, they don't, it's really not good to put like uh, styrofoam or things because it kind of goes against, you know, taking something that like that out into a sacred area, a pure area, and then we, you know, um, leave stuff there. Okay. Oh, what, what, what happened there? Okay. So uh, usually just a little bit of every dish is put in there. Just a little pinch, take a spoon and they put a little bit, all the bread, take a pinch, everything could be a little bit of the water, a little bit of the tea, coffee, sweet drink, whatever. And you just, you know, you put all that stuff. And then uh, tobacco is usually... Uh, given to an elder and then he'll hold the tobacco up and the spirit dish and offer a prayer and then when he's done he'll put that tobacco in there in the dish and it, then it's taken out far enough it's away from a lot of the domestic animals okay and we'll go on okay so this is uh the first half of the year this is all the different feasts and ceremonies that take place uh, at Turtle Mountain. And I believe elsewhere too, because I've been over at these different reservations out east, worked and lived there, and they have almost the same thing as we do. So during the Kitchi Manitou geese, the great spirit moon. Those are the times for putting up the trade dance, bargain dance. Uh, we are honoring a uh, spirit of the winter. And then on Dick geese, the crow moon, late March, we have the bear lodge and bear dance. Okay. Uh, there's a few variations I've seen. But basically, it's it's just minimal. But Red Lake, White Earth, Leech Lake, I don't know about up in uh, Net Lake and Fond du Lac. I'm, I've heard they have theirs too, but I haven't attended those ones. But on Dick Geese's again, Spring Solstice Observe. Usually, that's a communal event, or it can be a family event. You know, where they just time women come together and they cook and they ask for a prayer and they're honoring the spring. Everybody looks forward to the spring, you know, especially after a long cold, been inside a lot. Glad to see the warm weather come. Again, in the crow moon, we don't have this back home, but across the river. The maple sugar camps and harvest time. That's a big event. That's a big event. And families will cut and store wood at their, their camp, maple sugar camp, the fall before. And there's big stacks of wood because uh, once the trees are tapped and sap comes out, they have to boil the sap down to get at uh, the syrup and to make the sugar. And they have a big feast when that happens. So, and then all those who take part walk away with some of the harvest. And of course, they offer always the first syrup and the first uh, the sugar to the spirits. Thank them for it. Uh, the first thunder event. 
probably one of the oldest. Uh, this is a family thing where they offer uh, when the first thunder happens, they offer they all go out or usually so they go out. They offer their tobacco to the first thunder being coming. And then they'll have a feast after things calm down. Family renewals for fam uh, for their family medicine, feathers, and whatever they deem as sacred could be their medicine bundles. They open up everything, put them on blankets or hides, and they take everything out. Fumigate. They have a feast. You can invite people over. They chose to. Everybody can look. And then hopefully it's on a sunny day and then after the feast and the bundles and everything is put back and they're renewed, okay? Uh, that happens in the spring. Uh, during the frog croaking moon, Omaka Ki, Jesus, the teaching lodge, usually the in the spring of the Madewan. Introduction to newcomers, usually the first degree, there's teachings for that given, and then second degree, third degree, fourth degree. More teachings, longer sessions, and then uh, they're prepared for the main event in the fall. So some of them are inducted at that time if they had their teachings that winter and their teachers uh, certify them. Okay. Again, during this moon, this is usually a communal event because they have to have somebody that's given tobacco and a gift to put this event on a woman's water ceremony. Okay. That's a big one because uh, it really impacts the harvest of uh, planted plants and it impacts the wild berries and the medicines and everything. Without the water ceremonies, uh, you notice that uh, especially the berries and the medicines don't seem to grow right or there's not enough or the, the harvest is lean. But, after, but when they have the water ceremonies, there's always robust uh, harvest, good harvest. Plus it affects the water. The water use the, the women use this as an opportunity to purify the waters. And uh, they had a big water ceremony years ago. I remember uh, they uh, had found uh, that one of the I don't know, the farmers would spray it on their crops, 2,4-D, and they found that some of this had leaked into the surface water at Turtle Mountain, and people were getting a lot of cancers, and it was affecting birth and stuff, and so they, uh, they didn't know what to do, and, and that actually impacted, so the tribal council went to uh, Department of EPA, and then uh, the interior department and a few, few years later we had we got our big rural water system where they actually drilled down and into the aquifer but people were still using their subsurface uh, ground wells and so they had a couple of these uh, uh, women water ceremonies but it seemed to help it seemed to help clarify the water somehow. So anyway, that didn't have the prolonged effect. Okay. Again, in May, there's an offering and feast to the birch bark tree. Okay, so only families who really use the birch bark Either they fast in baskets or they actually make the wild rice. So 
they they make the big winnowing trays when they uh, cook the rice and then they throw it up in the air. And so they make those and different other articles they use, the canoe makers, different ones. Yeah. Okay. We'll go. And this starts a new session. <laughs> all right, let's. Uh, all right, I better drink uh, some. Let's get a little, get a little sip here. So, again, here we see Umaki geese. It's the fro frog croaking moon again. We have Mik Winda Mowin Indash Gijik, the remembered stay of the month. So, what the families do is they'll, uh, the families will gather. Maybe not at one time, but they'll gather on a certain day. But sometimes you to see two or three family groups there at the graveyards. And, uh, or if they have their own, Turtle Mountain doesn't have too much of that, uh, individual graves. Uh, the old uh, graveyard towards Belcourt, uh, they had a lot of, long time ago, the spirit houses that built over the graves, little tiny houses, long houses with the window open and they would make food offerings, but they cook food right there. And while they're cooking, the men will sing songs on hand drums, sing songs and traveling songs and uh, remembrance song, or maybe somebody had passed that had some songs and they'll sing his song or her song to honor them. And when that's done, they'll go place these little dishes of food uh, at the graves, at the head of the graves, and they'll talk to that person, remains their spirits. And, uh, and sometimes from there, if there's any food left, They'll talk to their ancestors through that door in the fire and they'll take the rest of it and they'll put it in the fire too. And so that's what that comprises of. Okay, so, uh, and then, uh, but in the old days they used to build as, once they buried that person, uh, they would put a white cloth over it, a white sheet over it, stones down and then within the next moon they had the family would have built a little tiny house oh probably a foot and a half high and then a little bit longer than the grave a little bit wider than thing and then they'd bring that and put it over the grave and what that was for that would protect from people, uh, or not people, but uh, wild animals digging. Because a long time ago, they didn't uh, bury people that deep. Now, it's state law that you have to go down six feet. And the reason you have to dig so far down is because when they had uh, like smallpox and cholera diseases, they had to go down so feet and it got to be that became the norm. So now they're not going so deep anymore. So they, they're building these little spirit houses. So, you know, the parents or the children will come back during this person's birthday or even sometimes and they'll go there and they'll put tobacco or cigarettes there and, or they'll put some food there and, maybe you know and they'll talk to that person in those little spirit houses so so people observe those a lot again here we have summer solstice about june 22nd 21st well a big one flowering moon gesis that's important 
because usually on this date or about this date for Turtle Mountain and a lot of the, the Bungi or the Anishinaabe who are uh, Plains Ojibwe, they put on their annual uh, thirsty dance, Nipi Kwechum Win. And uh, this actually is a Cree word. It's not a Chippewa, it's a Cree word because that's, we, we got this ceremony from the Cree back in around 1824, okay? And that's, that's a big uh, feast. Every day this goes on. And interesting, our people bring the feast inside the lodge and, they, and the dancing stops and they take a rest, the dancers, and the people bring all the food into the center of the lodge and they feast and drink and eat watermelon. <laughs> and not the dancers. <laughs> so it may seem kind of cruel, but that's just how it is. Uh, with this ceremony, especially, this one has a bundle. There is a bundle that's included in this ceremony. And that bundle is uh, untied at the start of it. And uh, it's opened, yeah. So. How many uh, thirsty dancers is there in Turtle Mountain every year? Oh, well, there's one. I think there's three. Go on, yeah. Yeah. Now, in our way, in our way, uh, the man has to dream. Uh, you don't become a Sundance leader because even if you have the teachings, you you just can't do that. You It has to be confirmed by the spirits, meaning you've had to have continuous dreams that involved in your dreams, uh, thunder bins, and you have to see uh, lodges, and you have to see, uh, you have had to see a boy, a single boy within that too. That's a confirmation the spirits have chosen you to put up a lodge, okay? And there's a reason behind that, of course. The boy represents the first, is the name of that tree, that Sundance tree. It actually has a name. We do chimpanes, means he goes with the thunder beings. Uh, or a uh, lone man. So uh, the story behind that is a manifestation of the Sundance, so why that takes place. So. so that person has to go to somebody who has actually been taught that way and put up lodges before, and he goes to him with Sema and, and gifts and asking him if he will guide him in putting up the lodge. So he has to learn songs, he has to know all the protocol, it's quite a uh, quite a, a lengthy and a experience because there's so much to know about that and things that have to be done on certain days and and all that stuff. And usually the first year that elder will help you the first year and the second year that elder stands with you that first year, second year, and then your second and third, fourth years, you're usually on your own. Now, the thing about this, again, I guess I'll, this will be the last talk about that because we've got other stuff to carry, is that he who puts that on also has to dance. <laughs> so he has helpers who have to know their job and what to do and he has to count on them and so not only does he because he suffers for the people so he has to dance too and go through all the rituals that uh 
the other men do, and sometimes even more, okay? So it's quite an ordeal. Um, it's an avowed dance, meaning you, ha you have to have a good reason to dance, a very good reason. You can't just dance because you're a pipe carrier or you've done 30 sweat lodges. The creator gives us plenty of reasons uh, to do things for people within our family or within our community. Uh, that those that are healthy and, and well are willing to sacrifice for so many days and possibly even going through the, the flesh offerings that it entails and the pulling of those ropes, the hanging ceremonies. So, yeah. All right, let's go on. My wind zoki assist the berry moon. These are when officially the Ego Shimo vision quest starts, usually during this first berry moon, and choke cherries are usually ready for that. And then there's a lot of animals out, birds and different things for that. And boys are usually or even men are taken out for their vision quest. Now, they can go on multiple vision quests. You know, it depends on different things. So, yeah. And that's usually, uh, there's an elder that assists them in preparing them for that vision quest and all that it entails and with instruction. And then, of course, when it's over, there's a big feast. So, family's happy. That person's back. Usually, vision quests can take four days. You know, seven days, eight days, ten days. Some of the longer ones go 20 days. I've even heard... There are a few who have done 30 day. So, but there's preparation for that, and those require a little bit more instruction and all that stuff. So, ah, uh, okay. All right. sis, the medicine moon, August. Ba Wenang, the harvest, medicine, natural foods. The harvest, gathering berries, medicines, getting ready, singing, singing to these plants, telling them what you're going to do, enticing them, honoring them because they're going to give their life. They're going to give their spirit for healing and for wellness. So there's an offering. And then, of course, the first fruits are usually put on a rock shelf or on you know, birch bark, usually up in the northwest corner direction. Some I've heard some do it in the southwest too, because of the time of the year. Uh, yeah, so that is done. Again, in September, another Ba Wenam. Another harvest time. Monomen, wild rice, vegetables, grown vegetables. People have their vegetables. Uh, gathering of more medicine. Uh, this is a big time way out east, especially the, the wild ricing camps. It's really a celebration. I mean, people still harvest a lot of wild rice. Although a lot of it today is, uh, they, the tribes have uh, processing plants where they process the wild rice instead of not process it like in the old days. Although there are some, they still do that. But so usually the owner of the processing plant 
requires for every uh, I don't know pound of wild rice. I think it's five. You get uh, the processor gets one pound for every five pounds, something like that. So uh, they that's how they a deal that usually they make something like that. Okay. What day, Pagagi sis? The Madeleine Lodge, September, okay, the end of summer, okay. This is a big event, so there's a lot of people that go through, and usually that ceremony is about 11 days. It can even go to 14 days, where people make large camps, and they go through that, and there's a lot of... Uh, you know, a lot of people there, a big camp, uh, cooking, cooking, a lot of cooking, a lot of cooking for the daily feast. Uh, usually they start in the morning and they get done in the afternoon sometimes, or sometimes they'll start uh, in the afternoon and they'll go into the night. A lot of singing, a lot of uh, other things go involved there. Uh, much of the Madewan is secretive. Even words and phrases before you go in the lodge, you have to, you're taught how to, what to say. It's like a password, let's say. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and they carry in their medicine bundles, their degree, depending on degree, and they support those who are going in, they need so many people uh, for going through the first degree. They need more people who are different degrees and higher degrees going through the second, third, and fourth, and all of that. So, and so, uh, and then the dance, there's actual dancing that goes involved there, but that's, it's not the same kind of dancing you would see at a powwow. And it's somewhat a stationary dance. And that stationary dance can be seen in the thirsty dance. So there's kind of a stand in one place and, and sometimes they'll move to one direction or to the other. Yeah. So these are big long lodges. Some of them are like 80 feet long by 20 feet wide. And sometimes it's, uh, they're covered partly way up, you know, where the top is open. And sometimes I've seen them covered two thirds of the way up, you know, where everything is covered up. And so people can sit, stand on the outside, look in. Uh, yeah, it's a, a very quiet camp and yeah, so it's just, it's also a good time to see old friends and stuff visiting. Okay. We don't have enough degree people at Turtle Mountain. We have people there of all degrees. I don't think we have any more eight degree people. We used to a, a few years, the last one died. Uh, so what happens is the one in the spring is a teaching lodge and from there they go over to Red Lake or to White Earth. Uh, and from there they can go on up to uh, the a different community up in Leech Lake and there's then you can go also go into uh, Wisconsin. And they've been having them out at Madeline Island and at uh, Ooh, forgot there was another one. <laughs> I'll think about it. All right. What day, Paga? Isis, fall solstice, observance. Here, the people are praying for good hunts because, uh, you know, 
start making preparation for the winter. There's there's people getting their traps ready. People are making sure that they have enough food. They're getting ready. Uh, they're canning things like that. Getting ready uh, in the North Country. Uh, they're long winters. Huh? Question. Yes. Okay. Um, Degrees in the Medea when there's uh, there's different levels of learning. Okay, let's let me just put it this way: like uh, in elementary, in in first grade, they teach you about so much and maybe introduce math in its simplest form or writing or different things, very fundamental things. And then you go on to second grade and you learn a higher level. It's a higher level of learning and it's a building constructive process that's built on, okay? But the teachings involve water. It involves vegetation. Uh, it involves uh, bushes that have medicine, uh, berries trees they talk about fire in there they talk about air smoke life is full of uh, many plants are medicine plants or they're edible plants uh, they teach you how to use and live a proper life along with taking care of the earth and using the earth uh, to heal you and to make you well again with ceremony. And so there's knowledge and there has to be teachers who've learned this stuff teach you. So they call them degrees. Some places they go up as high as eight degrees. Your eight degree Madeo and that's the highest you can go. Some places only have four, four degrees because the six no, the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth is a retake of the third, fourth, and fifth. No, the third and fourth degree. But it's more sophisticated and it, it entails learning more songs and creating a... Um, a language of understanding with plants and animals and other natural phenomena and spiritual phenomena. And so these people can potentially become very powerful. Okay. So uh, where they learn uh, sacred arts and stuff. A lot of these arts are protected by uh, the sixth, seventh, and eighth degree people. And there has to be uh, years of trust and training uh, to teach you those. So, uh, yeah. So sometimes it's a lifetime learning ordeal. <laughs> so, uh, but then again, we're losing more elders. Uh, I'm hardly an elder, but I'm, I think, but I, uh, there's so many more that know so much more than me. And, uh, but it takes up a lot of your time and it requires a lot of you. So uh, if you're married and have a family, you know, it's best to get them involved too, so. But this is the oldest way of our people teaching, the Medeoan. It's been with our people, it seems like for millennial, plus millennial, the Medeoan. And we'll talk more about that uh, in two sessions when uh, later on in the new year, so. 
Okay, the fall, okay. Uh, Anakwe gets this. So it was during this October, the falling of leaves, Pijiki Chimowen, the Buffalo Dance and Feast. So this is the time, uh, the weather really affects the animals. It's at that time during October, late October, it starts freezing at night, affects the leaves, they start falling. The animals start taking on their winter furs. Uh, and so uh, they also, it's a time the buffalo dance happens, okay? Uh, the buffalo dance can also be, happen during the thirsty dance. And there is a, other, another society we haven't talked, and that will be a presentation later on the different societies of our people, like the Windigu Khan, the Gu Khan society. They have their ceremony and dance at the time of the thirsting dance, where they will come in the dance and dance in the lodge. And also the bear dancers, they'll come, sometimes have it in the spring, <clears throat> but they also have the bear dance during the thirsty dance and they'll bring it in there to enact it in front of the people. Yeah. Uh, along with the horse dance, but Turtle Mountain hasn't had the horse dance in many years, so, okay. Kiyosi, uh, Kiyosi is November. And this is, uh, again, Bawinam. This is a harvest time for large horned animals, hoofed animals. Hunting season, moose, deer, elk. And so people are trying to potentially get enough meat for the winter. So this is a very busy time when families will get together, the men will go out hunting. Even women. When I lived in Red Lake, right across the road from us was a couple old ladies. And uh, I think they were widows, but they shared the same house to keep themselves from getting lonely. Well, one day when I was just getting ready to go, go to work here, I seen them coming, hauling their gear out and they were dressed in warm wool clothes, some camouflage, and they were hauling out rifles. And I thought, can't be these old ladies are going to go hunting, you know. But sure enough, when I came home and here they had a big buck that they had suspended from a limb of a big tree. <laughs> so I was waiting and waiting for them to, uh, you know, they had skinned it. Pull the, well, they, it like, the, the hide stayed on for a few days and then all of a sudden it, they must have peeled it off. And uh, I was waiting for them to uh, cut it up, quarter it up. And it stayed there. A week went by, two weeks went by. And then poor deer's meat just was turning black. <laughs> so uh, I think eventually they took it down. They might have cut it up, but... <laughs> They already, half of their the deer's carcass was already dry meat. <laughs> so anyway, so they go out and get their meat. So the ladies and the girls, when the meat's brought in, a lot, they, a lot of times they'll, uh, if it's not, if they don't have a garage, they'll push their furniture aside or, and uh, they'll put ply boards or they'll put, this queen or plastic on the floor and bring in ply boards and they all sit around cutting the meat up like that. So, and they're laughing and enjoying each other. But the thing with that, one deer, usually for that, it's split up amongst maybe two, three, four families. So it doesn't necessarily go to that particular family. The woman, who's that household belongs to, she decides where that meat goes, not the man. 
once the man drops it off there, brings it there, it's out of his hand. He, he, she decides, you know, how it's going to be harvested or spent. So she bites her sisters up, then they'll get some of that meat. So the man has to go out and hunt more and more. So, and that's how it is. That's just our way, our custom. So that's a very important time too. So at this time too, sometimes the first kill ceremony happens. Maybe a young boy or boy or young male or uh, a near adult boy will get his first deer or moose and that'll just turn into a big family event where they'll celebrate this young man and he'll have the first dish and now he can sit with the men and do things with the men. But usually a part, bet one of the best parts of that deer are put out and tied in a red cloth and it's tied to a tree so that deer spirit can live. Uh, they'll teach him that. And so whatever he kills, it could be a goose, could be a duck, just a little bit of meat, it's a big deal. Now he's deemed a hunter, he's, he's able to provide for himself. Okay. He was seek Isis. Again in November, we have Wee Khan, Gi Win, Sa, Nana Buju, the feast for Nana Buju. We just had that here last month, asking Nana Buju for permission after the first snowfall to tell our sacred stories. And this the snow has to be on the ground. And the reason for that is people always ask that question, why, why, do you, why does snow have to be on the ground? Because the spirits go into hibernation. Most of them go into hibernation. And there's a whole set of other spirits that are awakened that have to do with the winter. And so, uh, but Nana Buju, because of his influence, in the spiritual realm, as he's our advocate, he's our father, he's our like our grandfather, he advocates for the uh for our well-being. So he's asked to, he's called upon, and he also talks to the spirits on our behalf that we can honor and uh acknowledge the spirits that we talk about in our stories. Usually at the first, and this could be a family or community event. However, that community wants to do it. Uh, and some of the communities, uh, they have several storytellers, could be uh, men, women, elders, you know. Okay. And then the last one, the little spirit. The Manitou Kishasun, the Little Spirit Moon, uh, the Pong Solstice, the Winter Spirit uh, Solstice is observed. So there, uh, you know, people come together asking the winter to be kind to them, to watch over them. So that their family and animals will live. So, yeah. Yeah. This kind of ceremonial lodge we need right here. Okay, any questions? Oh, okay, we got more, don't we? <laughs> One more slide. No, we got a few more. Oh, yeah. Our Shingen. We do our, we do kai did servers or helpers clean up. And so now in our way, the servers and cleanups in large communal feasts are males, older boys. Always have been, always will be. And or men, depends if there's not too many boys or teens. So these are usually when 
that old lady who's in charge of these feasts, she will call upon these boys, or sometimes it's the same boy in the family, the community, and they'll call them together, and they'll be the servers of the food, okay? They will serve the food. There's no long lines formed. Some, well, sometimes there is, but... So this is the protocol for serving people. You have your elders first. You know that. Then your leaders and counselors, okay? Then your warriors, okay? Are all served first. Then adults, then younger people. So th this is the protocol for how food is supposed to be served out to these people first, not just elders, but leaders, community warriors, and all those served. Servers are to put their dishes aside after the warriors. So the warriors are all supposed to sit in one place. The, it's supposed to be somewhat organized. So all these servers put their cups and dishes right there. Maybe there's six servers and they put out six plates and dishes and stuff. So when they go around serving the food, they put a little bit in their plate their bowl, their cups. So they don't forget to serve themselves too. Okay, then a portion is put in their dish. All food is to be given out to the people. None is to be saved or reserved, okay? All right, so usually at big communal gatherings, uh, all the food is given away. If it's a family gathering, usually it's the woman of the house who has say where the food goes. If she wants to give, keep some for herself and her children, that's, that's her right to do. Uh, if she wants to give some of it, again, it usually follows this protocol. Leaders, elders, counselors, warriors, adults, those who actually were there and maybe have these positions, okay? Uh, all cleanup is usually done by the servers afterwards. The one in charge of the feast, the old lady, dictates the du duties of the cleanup. So it's all organized. So usually this old lady and the cooks, uh, if there is a giveaway, if there's an honor and a giveaway, she's also given a gift for her time and her... Uh, for uh, helping with organize all that, it's a big it, it's a big deal. So usually we have them like at if we have that uh, thirsty dance. There's a couple women who are in charge, and they cook and they're in charge. So there's usually four days of that cooking and all the serving, and it's it's a big deal. There's uh, so okay. Kiti anime, agi dene gi win, ancient offerings. These are the offerings of long ago that I know of, that were taught to me. In the old days, they don't have this too much anymore because people don't know about it. Painted sticks were offerings, okay? Bark was peeled off, it was left to dry, and then they were painted different colors, or may it be your color or something, you know, like that. They were you and these painted sticks were used as an invitation or summons to also attend an event, usually a spiritual event. Before there was a lot of tobacco. Okay where they had a lot of tobacco. Tobacco was hard to get. That's why it was so sacred. It was hard to get. Not everybody. A lot of the tribe, the, the community had to grow their own tobacco and to get tobacco. Okay, these were used as invitation sticks, but they were also an, an offering to the Manitouk. 
Sticks used were made from berry bushes. Bark sticks were either peeled or scraped and dried, then painted with the person's colors, okay? Those, per, those are the same colors he would paint himself during special ceremony or if he went out to fast or different things, okay? Feathers and or plumes were also used as offerings to the Manitouk. Small hawk, eagle, or other colored type of feathers, plumes, were tied on one end of a scrape painted stick. So the stick was maybe this long, 16 inches maybe, painted perhaps mostly on one side and the feather was tied on the top, okay? The petitioner, those who did that, smudged the offering stick and themselves, a prayer was said, then the individual or multiple sticks were, were stuck in the ground or by the water's edge. Okay, women made their offerings that way too, by the water's edge, or sometimes right in the water a little bit. Sometimes they were bundled up, sometimes the painted sticks and or feather painted sticks were tied in a bundle and placed in the fork of a tree and or tied to it as high as possible. Okay, and those were offerings, offering sticks. Okay, before cloth, before there was cloth. Okay, and the reason for these uh, kind of feathers was because they had stripes on them or there was some kind of color to them. You know, they weren't just plain colored feather. They had to, okay. All right. Uh, Gigat aname pagi denen gigit ye win. Today's offering. We panusanan referring to a bright shiny cloth or paint. Okay. At the coming of the Europeans, the Manitouk seen the shiny cloth worn by them and desired the shiny painted cloth. So we panusanan refers to a shine or a sheen or something bright, something like something's painted because all the colors of the earth that were in the earth, a lot of times uh, it had, they had a dull color, but when rain hit a plant or a flower and it shined, it glistened through the, through the water, magnify it, the spirits were attracted to it. So the elders said they were, attracted to this therefore thereafter the Anishinaabe traded for the cloth for themselves and as an offering to the Manitou believing it contained power to summon them okay that's why we offer the cloth to summon the spirits and the and the prayer of the tobacco that it holds okay all right, we're going on to another one, the final. Is it the final slide? Okay. There was a woman, an elder woman here in some of the first uh, presentations we had this fall was uh, asking about medicine bundle. Okay. Uh, uh, I was on this picture. I thought it was very cool. Very cool. Yeah. The opening of a medicine bundle must be during their the renewal ceremony, as you can see. You know, there is something in here, like a long spear, but arrow tied feathers, more. You know, this could be paint or this could be actual herbal medicine or something. I'm not sure what that is, a stone or what these are, but okay, what are they? What are medicine bundles? Sacred items, objects that are stored in a protective container. Containers <clears throat> can vary in size and shape. They can be durable bags made of many kinds of materials as blankets, animal skins, 
even suitcases. A durable container that holds your sacred objects. Of course, long time ago, they used to use hides. You know, that was the only durable container or rawhide and something like that. So, uh, individually, sacred items vary per person. These so, objects are used, used in prayer and petitions. Everything okay? Was he trying to talk to you? Okay, well, I'm going to explain. Let me, uh, okay. Hold on. Okay. Why they're sacred, these items, to the individual is because they use these in prayer. Much like, for example, the Catholic will use a rosary in their prayer, in their petition. Okay. Native people and the Anishinaabe did the same thing. They held feathers. They brushed themselves with their sacred feathers. A lot of times they were the, of the eagle feather, hawk feather, depends the swan or loon, special feathers that had meaning to them. They would use them. These are sacred. These were items of their bundle, okay? Uh, they also contain natural medicines for health and well-being. Maybe they had a favorite medicine that kept them well, okay? And they used it for their family. Uh, clothing items for ceremonial wear or, or dancing, singing, objects for self-protection, also items for prayer, medicine, okay? So paints included in this worn in ceremonies, okay? Uh, Sometimes the bundles contain bowls, a bowl, a plate, a platter, a cutting board, a knife or a spoon in preparing medicines. Uh, they also contain matches, lighters, uh, pointed or scraped sticks. Sometimes they had a pipe in their medicine bundle, a personal pipe or a special pipe that had to do with a ceremony or society. So these were generally, in a general sense, the contents of a medicine bundle, okay? And usually individuals uh, who use these things in ceremony or in praying or making a petition praying to the spirits or to the creator, they had their, their, uh, their bundle that they kept close to them, protected it. It could also contain uh, rattles. It could contain drums, hand drums that were used in ceremony or rattles used in singing. Uh, it could be eagle bone whistles, okay? Something that is rare and, and may be hard to come by, but also they put a high, value on it, a spiritual value. And so these were generally the contents of a medicine bundle in general, okay? So individuals could have these. You didn't have to ask permission to have a bundle. It's something you can prize that you compiled over maybe a period in your life and um, you used in prayer. And that was your personal medicine bundle. There was a different kind of medicine bundle. There were tribal medicine bundles. These are very sacred objects. They are cared for by one or two people who keep the bundle for their tribal group or for their tribal society or that group. The general purpose of these sacred uh, sacred bundles are usually related to the well-being and uh, 
the health and well-being of that tribal group. So there's different types of medicine bundle, but again, in a general sense, that's what they're used for, just for their, their health and well-being of the people. So they have a specific uh, function within that group. Some are very old, some are transitional. Okay. Yeah. You know, huh? they could, you know, be your tobacco, your sweet grass, uh, uh, they could be enough to put in a, a duffel bag, so to speak. Uh, they could be enough to be put in uh, a small bag or a bigger bag. It depends. Usually in the course of a life of an individual who prayed and went to ceremonies and did things for people, usually their bundle would grow, get bigger. Things he would acquire, knowledge he would acquire through the natural world, maybe through fasting, through the gifting, uh, the bundle would grow. So it could grow larger. It could be three foot by long by a foot wide, or it could be all contained maybe within a, a pipe bag, something like that. So they depended how involved that individual was with his family and his community. Maybe that person had several medicine bags, medicine bundles. Depends what he did for the community and his family. So, yeah. So, it had a lot to do with the size of the wrapper, too, what you had. And so, yeah. Did I answer that question? <laughs> Any questions from you guys? Okay. Richard? So this presentation just is based on general knowledge, not specific knowledge. So it's helped to guide you with certain questions you have about our culture and our or people so uh all tribal people i think from different tribal groups uh there's a lot of similarity but there's also some differences too but you know regarding this stuff you know uh generally women and girls didn't have medicine bundles only special women, elder women, when they got to be elders, were uh, given the rights uh, to do certain things because of their life and their experience depended on uh, a lot of choices they made and involvement with their families and community. Uh, did they attain any of this? All women new medicine and they did a lot of gathering of medicine as men did but i think women more so because that connection with the earth but uh, they formed their own medicine bundle so to speak where they had you know their containers of medicine to help their children and their family so i remember an old lady from back home uh, she was probably about 75, and she had a dream, and she asked that I come see her. I went and seen her, and she asked me to make her a, a woman's pipe, uh, a small black stone pipe. And, uh, and I, I did. I brought it to her, and she thanked me. She gave me a gift, and... 
but I remember being there, but she was, uh, I think that's something the spirit wanted her to have because it was with her in her casket. So, you know, she might have been preparing or use it as more of a tool, as a more power in a prayer where you can speak your voice and pray, but if you have your pipe, it, it gives you a little bit more leverage. I don't know if that's the right word, but, you know, direction. So, yeah. But with, with these kind of things, there comes a lot of responsibility to take care of them too. So, if something happens to your bundle, gets burnt or stolen, or then usually you're accountable because of that, because uh, for some reason you didn't take care of it enough, protect it. So, uh, yeah, you're accountable for it. So there's a... Uh, there's also a, a caveat, they call it. If you're going to, there's, you know, this is all good, but there's a caveat. There's kind of a warning, too, that you have to be careful. You got to make sure that you protect what is given to you like that, these spiritual things. Sincerity. Feathers. Huh? Yeah, sincerity. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so you, Yeah. So it's a responsibility that you've taken on, and so you got to be careful how you use it, conduct your life, all that. And like we have, on, I've explained that before, you know, you have to renew it. You have to renew it. You have to use it. You have to renew it. You know, you, it cannot become an artifact. Uh, so... Yeah, it has to be used to better your life, your family's life, your community's life, you know, help. So, yeah. One of the things uh, I find that we, we face here in Great Falls mm -hmm. and maybe in other communities, is uh you know on reservations it's nice because you have you have that land base yeah and you have that cult that community and you have that uh a lot of elders with a lot of knowledge you know and everybody comes together and they work you know when it's time to do those ceremonies and, and they they're, they're you know trained and they understand what needs to be done and you know they're learning and that, you know, from a young age, and that continues. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that, just in the 20 years I've been here in Great Falls, that I've noticed, and I'd like, I'd like to say what my late brother-in-law, Glenn, used to always say, was <clears throat> they do those ceremonies up on the hill. And he remembers, you know, in the 50s, 60s, 40s, whatever, even into the 70s. They, they, they come together like for a fight ceremony or a round dance or you know whatever it may be and there'd be 50 60 70 people you know gathered around and then he would say you know as time went on that 60 70 80 people would be like 20 people yeah you know, 10 and you know like it, sometimes and and well, it's tough because of the dominant society, but then people always need to remember you need to put the creator, you need to make time for the creator. You well, know? we've we've had sickness hit our people. You know, uh when people like in the twenties during the uh the what do you call the dust bowl days, when things become very desperate, you know. A lot of native people started leaving the reservation look, looking for work and they were free to do so. And and then of course, right before World War II, uh, a lot of young people left. But what came out of it, not just serving their country, but there started to be a lot of bootlegging on the reservation and alcoholism, 
And that continued a lot of drinking and that took a lot of people's lives and it interfered with uh, that tribal tribalism that kept the people together. And uh, my old father-in-law, uh, they put away uh, a lot of their ceremonies for close to 20 years be because people had started getting so drunk, the community got so intoxicated that people were coming to the ceremonies and actually passing out or falling down or he told me of one time an old lady went up to where they were getting ready to have a feast and she fell forward she was drunk putting her arms and hands into the pots soup pots and stuff and you know kind of contaminating that and I mean, it was just like that. So what happened at uh, the alcoholism split the community. Now today, it's the, the drugs that are taken, were taking a hit on that really bad. And so that's uh, caused people not to come. Uh, first thing they wake up in the morning or they think about, is where they're going to get their drug what they can steal to get to buy that drug you know that's they're not thinking about smudging offering their same on and that's that's another thing that's hurt our people so we're always we're in a fight now to preserve our culture and our ways you know i mean uh people have to really go out and and try to uh be good examples today oh yeah i remember there was a lot of people used to attend but it's uh the land base is important but you know uh building our community by getting us together you know that's why i'm here it's trying to provide opportunity for us to come together if you're not in that mindset of doing that coming every week and and getting your spirit and your soul fed through the teachings and thinking about this then you're not going to be in that mindset it's going to be interrupted by you know your jobs and other daily life of society and stress you know you gotta it, it's something you gotta work out at, at today so you know for and of course we can't Community can't be well until individuals become well. <laughs> but we need our support. We support ourselves. So, yeah, I know what you mean. But I'm hoping uh, by this spring uh, that the tribal council will provide for us uh, uh, not only a place uh, to have a sweat lodge, but also we have a place uh, where we can uh, uh, come together outside and, you know, have ceremony and gatherings, teachings, you know, that's what I'm hoping for. And I've already mentioned that too. You know, huh? Yeah. 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 And, you know, they're all optimistic. So I keep putting that bug in there. And so it's, uh, yeah. But, all right. Miigwech, everyone. Uh, tune in for next week. Have a good evening.